this session is building exit value. Uh, we've got a team of four um, joining us. Thanks, uh, Josh. Thanks for coming back up. Um, also, Colin Groves, who's uh, you're two years back in New Zealand, is it? No, seven. 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 Oh, it's two years since we met with uh, two years since we met with uh, Mia Mobile and and Sea Dragon. Um, Brian Russell, who it's sort of an underground story. Uh, Zephyr was founded by Brian in 2003. It's a Kiwi company. Went off to the U.S. Uh, sold it to a listed company. Uh, was it last year? 2014. 2014. Um, sailed around, almost cliche, sailed around on a boat, and now uh, we've got them back in the country, so great to have you. Uh, and uh, Ambassador Mark Gilbert, welcome. So the format of this session is, uh, is sort of four presentations and, and then some Q&A. So welcome, the name's Colin Gross. Uh, I apologize, one or two of you may have seen my presentation before, um, but hopefully it's still very relevant. So. This is me. I've been involved with various companies over the years. Um, the, probably the most relevant one to, to this forum is Informix. Some of you may have heard of Informix. I actually joined them as employee number three in Europe. It was very much a startup company when I joined them. Um, Informix had two competitors that were startups at the same time. One was called Microsoft, and the other was called Oracle. Uh, Informix had a product portfolio that competed with Oracle and a product portfolio that competed with Microsoft. Um, so it was interesting times. I would argue that the Informix products were actually better. Uh, we were very much an IT engineering geeky company, whereas the other two were very much more into sales and marketing. We all grow, grew by, uh, like Topsy and eventually Informix was actually bought by IBM for a billion US dollars, which is not a bad story in its own way, but nobody really ever hears about the Informix story. Last 25 years, well, best part of the last 25 years, I've worked for one of the world's largest private companies. It's a company called Tetra Laval. Most of you probably haven't heard of Tetra Laval, but most of you have probably seen this thing, which is the Tetra Pak car. Uh, it's a rather secretive family that owns the business. We're on the third generation. Um, but we have a very professional board. Um, our board's made up of the chairman of BMW, the chairman of HSBC Bank, Rio Tinto, Lufthansa, and Tate and Lyle. So when you're dealing with those type of people, things are very serious in terms of presentations and how they're looking at businesses. My role was to look after mergers and acquisitions on a global basis. We were a group of 650 companies. Um, I've lost count how many deals I've done, both on the buy side and the sale side, and in most countries in the world. The biggest deals that I've done was one where we sold 165 companies, and that was over $2 billion. So three legs to the business, Dulaval, Tetra Pak, and Sedell. Sedell is all about water and plastic bottles. Uh, not very big in this part of the world. The biggest thing is Fiji waters down here. Um, I've kind of moved on from corporate life in the last couple of years, and I've now got a portfolio of directorships. Uh, they're all linked together in one way or another. Sea Dragon makes Omega-3 fish oil. Uh, I'm the chairman of that. It's on the New Zealand Stock Exchange, um, based in Nelson. MEA, which uh, Robbie mentioned earlier, uh, we've grown that in the last three years to about 60 people. So that was a startup, exactly what we've been talking about here. We've actually got an office in the US now. I'm always keen to link my businesses together. So my big passion is rugby. I'm chairman of Waikato Rugby. Um, so MEA has built apps for the rugby and we've actually got fan experiences and you can order your hot dogs and stuff off the app at the stadium. Um, we've built apps for Diosan and Diosan are in very close partnership with Vet South, which is a large chain of vets on the South Island. Things do go a little bit squiggly where you've got businesses that are interwoven. So you see I'm wearing my top here. So obviously the Chiefs, 
Um, and Diosan. Diosan are one of the chief's biggest sponsors. Um, we had the whole fiasco of Strippergate not so long ago. I'm sure everybody followed that. And being, being involved with these and chairman of these, I was in a very difficult situation. And we've actually, as a company, decided to focus more on women in agri than taking blokes to rugby going forwards. <laughs> So a little bit on, which is rather bright, a little bit on mergers and acquisitions. Um, I would say there's no such thing as a merger. People talk about mergers. I'm actually working on one at the moment, and both parties think it's 50-50. Reality is one party will always be bigger. And I can see this drifting, this deal drifting to a 60-40. So I would say there's no such thing as uh, a merger. Acquisitions, everybody wants to get involved when you're a large corporate. It's, you know, testosterone takes over. Oh, this is great. We're, all, we're going to go and buy something. I heard the mess, uh, mention 80 people turned up to this 20 people company. I've seen that. The reverse, when you're trying to sell part of a business in a large organization, everybody runs a mile. People don't want to get involved. So this is actually where Informix found itself. And Informix was the fish in the middle here. When we're looking at acquisitions, I always say, is there another way of doing this? Is the acquisition really necessary? Can we do an IP deal? Can we do a partnership? Um, we, I've just done a partnership in, in the UK. Uh, the Chiefs and Waikato Rugby, we've entered into a partnership with the Cornish Pirates, a rugby team in the UK. We had the opportunity to buy them, and we said, we don't actually want to own you. We want to help you grow and develop. We gain, you gain. So partnerships are often a way of looking at things. Um, Informix, Informix saw Oracle as its big rival. So every time Larry Ellison went out and bought a company, guess what? Informix had to do the same. So that was what we were up to. And of course, we didn't look behind. And the great big shark, IBM, came along and went Troop. So uh, when we're looking at businesses, I, these are the questions that I ask. You probably recognize the chaser, the governess. So what are we buying? Who are we buying from? Do they actually own what they're trying to sell? What are what are they selling, and why are we buying? I don't think that's me. You're not out of time yet. No, it's not me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so... Three key questions I always ask. Do we actually understand our own business? We need to take a look at what we're up to ourselves. Then the next question is, what will the acquisition actually add to our business? And from a Kiwi point of view, I often challenge my companies and say, if we're on the North Island, let's go and have a crack on the South Island. Or if we're on the South Island, well, let's go to the Waikato and see what we can do up there before we start dreaming of getting on planes and going global. Uh, so I always say, make, have a go, have a small acquisition in your own country, same language, same culture, everything's the same. When I was based in Europe, I kept saying, let's go to Belgium, because you've got French language, you've got the Dutch language, Europe kinds of meets in Belgium, and it's a relatively small country. I've discreetly brought in the colours of Waikato here, if nobody notices. <laughs> um, but if you screw up in Belgium, nobody's going to notice. <coughs> so where next? Well, I always say, start, play to your strengths. Uh, English language. I heard the comments about the, the US language and the English language. I see that all the time. I even have a problem between English English in England and Kiwi English, and I'm often correcting myself. Um, Canada, we've got the Quebec link. 
UK, well, before Brexit, it was a natural beachhead into Europe, and Hong Kong is your beachhead into China. I would always say, try and work in your own language to start with. Don't try and dream of doing contracts in Spanish and French and things like that. <sighs> okay, valuations of businesses. I often get asked this, how do you value a business? And there is no right answer. Um, discounted cash flows to infinity, DCFs is the theory. But then what do you actually use as the discount rate? WAC, weighted average cost of capital. What rate do you use? I've actually been on a course for a whole day on beta coefficients, which <laughs> is another layer of what a weighted average cost of capital is. I nearly gave up the will to live on that course. <laughs> um, people talk about EBIT, EBITDA, NPLAT. What, what do you actually mean by the bottom line? I always look at what is actually the sustainable, regularised, normalised earnings of a business. Because a lot of the business could be subsidised by the founders or whatever, they're not taking salaries and things like that. Well ultimately if you buy the business, you've actually got to have somebody running the business. Apples with apples, often there's window dressing that goes on before a business is sold. Um, people talk about GAP and IFRS. You hear the word international uh, financial reporting standards. You think international sounds like everybody uses the same. Reality is there's different versions of IFRS. So don't be fooled into that. Uh, revenue recognition is probably the area that's the biggest uh, difference. Um, when you're looking at buying businesses, synergies is often a question. And I always say never give away your synergies. The synergies are yours. You're the guy doing the deal. You should keep the synergies. Uh, so, yeah, one of these puppies is probably the right valuation to the deal. But you tell me which one of the puppies is the right one. <laughs> that, one? <laughs> that one. Okay. So, often you get into this question when you're buying a business or selling a business. Do we do an asset deal or do we do a share deal? Um, if you're an acquirer, I will always try and do an asset, uh, asset deal. I don't want all the legacies of what the company's been up to in the past. I don't want the founders' tax liabilities mixed in. Have they been pouring sewage in the local river? I don't want a bill from the local council to clear all of this up. If I'm a seller, I will always try and sell the, the, the whole business and I will try and do a share deal. Often it, it all comes down to tax. And that, you see the scissors, that is often the thing that actually breaks the deal. People, I've actually got two slides on people. Uh, I actually say business is about two things. It's about people and it's about communications. Uh, often when you're going and buying companies, you run into, well, you know, this is the family from Father Ted. Trying to figure out who is actually the most important person here is always tricky. It's actually the guy down there and all he ever says is beer. But he's actually the most important person in this family. Two slides on people, so this is the other one, the Adams family. Dear old Gomez thinks he's in charge, but we all know reality is not quite the same. I've heard due diligence mentioned a few times today. It's all about getting your ducks in a row. Tetra Laval, we always started our due diligence down here, antitrust because there's no point in going buying something if the first thing that happens is, in here in New Zealand, the Commerce Commission turns around and says, no, you can't, you're suddenly a monopoly. So we always started our due diligence down there with antitrust. What I would say on all deals, for, you really need three key areas, the commercial team, finance and tax, and legal. And you should always get the commercial team in first before you start spending big bucks with the accountants and the lawyers. But often, the time bomb is sitting somewhere down here. So don't ignore all, all the so-called smaller areas. <coughs> Advisors, I heard the comment about the local fam family lawyer. Uh, that's a big no-no. <laughs> I would say hire the best you can afford. 
uh, because it will always come back and bite you. And to be honest, make sure the other side have actually got proper advisors too, because you can waste an awful lot of time with their mate's lawyer who has no clue about doing deals. Um, keep all your advisors fully motivated. Uh, keep them all on side. Get, it's crucial that they think this is the most important thing they've ever done in their lives. Otherwise, they're just, just doing another job. Okay, I'll probably skip over this. Different terminology, they all basically mean the same thing. Heads of terms, letter of intent, memorandums of understanding, moves. All I say is if you're ever going to prepare one of these, make sure you use the words non-binding indicative offer and that you've got ways of getting out of it. People say to me, 25 years of M&A, it must all be glory. Well, it's anything but. Uh, I can relate, this isn't actually me, but I have actually done this uh, uh, at Milwaukee Airport and the thought of about trying to get back to Auckland. Uh, and when you've spent a week charging around the US, that is exactly how you feel. Uh, some basic rules, I always say all emails and phone calls have to be answered within 24 hours, otherwise the deal has moved on. Um, a key thing here, a small mistake can destroy months of work. Just using the wrong phrase in a negotiation and a, somebody will get upset and bang, the deal's over. I've heard this mentioned a couple of times today as well. For me, this is the, probably the most powerful and most important slide here. Don't be afraid to walk away. You can get sucked into a deal, you can spend a lot of time and effort, but at the end of the day, not doing the deal might actually be the best thing for you. So over my career, the shortest deal I've ever done is three months. The longest actually took me 10 years from start to finish, and we did finish it. And the longest uh, where we've actually walked away and spent considerable amount of dollars was three and a half years. So uh, yeah, don't be afraid to walk away. Um, this one is kind of obvious in that the more you do acquisitions, the more successful you become. Uh, first timers are probably going to fail because you don't know what you're doing. Uh, rule of thumb, 50% of acquisitions fail. My focus is always to do safe deals. Uh, the price, yes, is important, but it's far more important to do a safe deal. You don't want to spend the next five years arguing and in courts over a deal that you've done badly. So, I've got a few war stories. Um, so these are some of my stories, just extracts of what I've been up to. It's quite funny, when you pick up a copy of the Victor, you realize how politically incorrect it is, where they talk, talk about damn bloody Huns and get, get the Krauts and all of this, and you think, my God, we can't use language like that anymore. We might have to have so one more story. Oh. Okay, we'll go with the first one. Uh, so, an exit or rather an exit that's still going on. Uh, 25 years ago, uh, Tetra Laval bought a town in Russia, <laughs> uh, complete with 5,000 people. Uh, there was no infrastructure, so they built houses for the people. Uh, they built uh, a hotel, they built the hospital, the school, everything. Um, they run and own the bus company, 38 buses going around picking up all the people. Um, but over time, the customers have come and migrated and now actually have their, their, their companies around. So Nestle's opened up next door, uh, a very large chocolate box company, and then uh, Russia's biggest dairy, and it's a play on words. So it's owned by three guys, a Mr. Will, a Mr. Bill, and a Mr. Don. So they call themselves Wimbledon. <laughs> anyway, we've been trying to sell this for about the last four or five years. So yeah, it's about two hours south of Moscow. You actually have to fly on Air Siberia. This is Air Siberia. Uh, I joke that the planes are fluorescent green for one reason, and that's so you can find all the parts in the snow once, once it's, it goes splat. But anyway, so. There's a town for sale in Russia. Uh, please come and see me if you want to, <laughs> want to buy one of those. I've got to find an artistic director or something like that for, for better slides. 
Um, I think, uh, does he have, uh, I think he's pulling up the presentation. Uh, <clears throat> right, so, um, you know, what are corporations look for and what do we look for in the companies <clears throat> before we're funding them so that we know they're going to have an exit of some kind when they're ready, right? So <clears throat> we have a thesis approach at Rubicon to what we're going to invest in, which, you know, goes beyond product team execution and things like that. Uh, we want stuff that's a must-have versus a nice-to-have. So when you're talking about software, you want a company that is going to be able to sell into the enterprise or to a consumer or to whoever, and once they're using it, you don't want them to be able to rip it out quite easily, right? So that is a must-have versus a nice-to-have. So, you know, that's what we like to see. <clears throat> We like it to be a full product versus just a feature. You know, there are a lot of companies that will come up with something new, but when you look at it in the end, it's just a feature. So it's really not all that unique and it's sort of nice and whatever, but is it a full product suite? Uh, and that's what we like to see as well. Are people willing to pay for it? You really know if something's valuable if somebody is willing to pay for it. It's one thing when you give it away for free and you have like a freemium model to start, but then when you turn on the revenue generation, how many customers stay, right? So you want it to have some sort of revenue model and you want that revenue model to be uh, net positive unit economics. So as a consumer, and like most of you, I love venture-backed companies that are basically subsidized. Uber, all kinds of different meal services that you can find all over the place. Uh, any sort of entertainment type companies, gamers, whatever, it's great. They're not good investments, right? They're good products, we use them all the time, uh, but they don't make for good investments, so we don't like that sort of stuff. Uh, engagement, you wanna make sure your customers are engaged hourly, daily, monthly, annually, whatever it is. As long as someone's engaged with the product, they will miss it if they all of a sudden have to pay for it and then they're not using it. So if they're gonna miss it, they're gonna to wanna to pay for it so you like that engagement. If there's engagement and then it's just a feature and they can get it somewhere else, not all that valuable. So we wanna see that, right? You wanna have a full team. There's nothing worse than investing in a company and a company says, well, we're gonna use this money to hire a head of sales to generate sales for the company. That's bad. If you're a founder and you can't sell your own product, no amount of money is really gonna help you uh, in figuring it out. So we want to make sure that when we're investing in a company, they have a, a, a relatively full team. It's okay if they're hiring junior people and things like that, because then they're going to know how to execute on what they're doing, and they're going to create value for a potential acquirer. Uh, defensibility. We like companies that have uncompetitive advantages, as I've said before, so they have to be able to defend the product and service. If they're just a clone of something else, or just an Uber for this or something else, or a LinkedIn for that, uh, it's not really defensible, it's not a very interesting business, and anybody could just build it themselves as opposed to buying what they have, and it doesn't make it for an attractive acquisition. Um, Scalability. You want to make sure that a company is selling into a large enough market, it can scale up and continue to bill or add billing to its customers such that it's not just in one silo in an organization. So if they're selling to General Motors or IBM or Citibank or uh, Air New Zealand, you want them to be able to sell across multiple business units once they have their relationship in play and grow that revenue from that uh, initial relationship. Uh, you also want them to create value. They, you want to know that their customers realize this is really valuable, they're gonna use it every day, and they're gonna miss it when it's gone. If it's not really creating value and you don't really have a buy-in, they could just forget about it. If somebody leaves their job, or you know the company pivots or something like that, on the customer side, you all of a sudden don't have any revenue generation. So those are the kinds of things that we look for, and it sets it up for an acquisition. Right? And we like acquisitions. Acquisitions are typically clean, they're easy, they're relatively quick. Okay, if you do an IPO, it can take nine years typically in the United States for an IPO. That's a long time to be in a deal. That's longer than some marriages, right? So it's tough. <clears throat> um, what acquirers look for? No particular order. <laughs> um, accretive, and accretive is an accounting term. You basically want it to be positive. 
to your net income. For startups, that's not usually the case. They're usually a cost center to start, but if it can be accretive, you definitely want that. Uh, it'll provide a new market or customer or cross-sell opportunity. So when Salesforce or Microsoft or Twitter or PayPal or something like that buys a startup, usually it's gonna add customers to the bottom line for them. So they're gonna increase the amount of people that they can sell their product or service to already. And so it makes sense for them to buy it. Again, full product suite versus you know just a feature, right? Nobody wants just a little feature. Uh, scalable and defensible, we talked about, team. This is the case where you get into either an aqua hire situation or you really want your team to build something else. Uh, Uber recently bought Auto, which is a uh, self-driving co uh, truck company. So you can't really self-drive cars as well, because uh, there's too many of them, but trucks you can. So they bought this company for the full product, it's defensible, has a great team, it's scalable, so it made sense to buy it, right? So you want that in situations where you can't hire away the team one by one, you gotta buy the whole company and buy the team, right? Um, buy versus build, or it falls in competitor hands, same sort of thing, you might be looking at a company, uh, if you can't build it yourself, you've gotta buy it, or somebody else is gonna get it, right? Uh, this happened with the LinkedIn acquisition recently. This was a situation actually with Twitter, you know, some people wanted to buy it, but then nobody else did. So what was the rationale for buying it? Well, there isn't one, which is why they're not getting bought. So you wanna make sure that um, when you're looking to sell your company, or really when it's looking to bought, you don't overplay your hand and say, well, these guys might wanna buy it, and you piss off these guys here who never come back to the table, which was exemplified a few moments ago. And so, you know, it, it, it causes a problem. Um, value capture is again, you're, if you're the uh, acquiring company, you wanna make sure that you're getting something other than the product and the team. Customers, uh, access into markets that can be you know, geographically or in different vertical silos, but it's gotta make sense. If it's not gonna make sense, you're not gonna buy it, right? Cost effective, that's a tough one. Uh, in the United States, a lot of companies have been overpaid for. People don't really understand why these companies are getting bought for billions of dollars when it doesn't necessarily make sense. Here's the thing, a lot of public companies use their stock as a currency, so it doesn't really matter necessarily how much they pay for versus how much of a percentage of the company it is. So, you know, if AT&T is buying a company for a billion dollars, it has a you know, $100 billion cap, it's only 1%, not a big deal. Apple has 250 billion plus in cash, so they can buy companies just for cash. Nobody really cares, right? So they have to justify it in some way, but it doesn't necessarily have to be cost effective to the market. It just has to be cost effective to them. And then access to innovation. A lot of times these companies are siloed, they are just sort of going along. They don't necessarily have the pulse of what's happening outside their initial marketplace. So they wanna buy access to new innovative type stuff uh, and it's great for them and it makes them look like technology companies. So right now, a lot of banks in the US are trying to reinvent themselves as a technology company. So Goldman Sachs, it's a bank. They push paper, right? And they have relationships. They're actually rebranding as a technology company. For what reason? No very good one, other than it's cool for them. Uh, they might get a higher multiple, but then people you know, become more attuned to the brand. Uh, so that's something that's happening in that regard, and it, it gives the companies a reason to sort of reinvent themselves and rebrand and things of that nature. Um, so those are sort of just some of the themes that we're seeing, again, from you know, what we look to fund, and then how we want to position the companies to get bought. And, as I mentioned earlier, we are all about the exits. You know, we want to help people certainly, but again, we're investing. So we're investing a dollar, we want $10 back in a certain time frame. And if you can't do that as a venture capitalist, you're not gonna be a venture capitalist for long. You're really not, because people aren't gonna give you money. Um, so you gotta, you gotta make sure that you're able to do that. Okay. So hi everybody, I'm here to give you a brief explanation of uh, retrospectively what we did right, and nothing here is what we did wrong. So, uh, <laughs> and I see Greg Sittis is here, who was one of our original directors, so it's good to see that some of the team is here. So, um, I think the theme today has been think about the exit to begin with, 
I didn't know how to exit when I started. That's what uh, people like Greg and the VCs gave me. Uh, whereas now the advice I give is start with the exit and move backwards for, from a founder's perspective. And so the four steps I broke it down for today is we've got to grow the brand. So you've got to, you've got to be in a billion dollar um, market if you want any American money. So entrepreneurs say it's got to have a B in the presentation. Um, and the team's also got to be good. And the products I usually get involved with are scientifically <coughs> excellent. So they're very, very hard to copy if the science is very robust. I also see a lot of products that can get to 80% but can't quite get the specifications that's going to make it a successful product. So from an investment perspective, you want to figure out is the science actually going to deliver a product that you can ship or you're going to get stuck in that horrible malaise of trying to get the product to that last specification. Um, we did a brilliant job of having customers we could talk about. We had NASA, uh, we had Delta Force actually came to us through a contract from NZTE. Um, and uh, you know, they took us up on zero gravity flights. We got to go into the Delta Force base and everything. And so that gave us validation that we must have been good because we won that contract against our 19 other defense contractors that are mostly billion dollar companies. So that said we must be good. We also, um, to the angst of our salespeople, gave away product to academics. And academics suck because they take three years to publish, but after three or four years, we started getting peer-reviewed papers out that showed how good we were, and then the likes of Apple bought 150 because we were the gold standard for their watch. So we became the industry standard, which is really what you want when you go to start selling yourself and claim you're the best. Um, I've said billion dollar market, but that's the billion dollar market and what we were going to sell as. So we started as a defence contractor. Uh, when the Afghanistan and Iraq war finished, uh, the US uh, focus really went from war to Obamacare. And so we had to scramble and we did a pivot. Uh, we did a Series D, pretty stressful at the board table, and uh, convinced the, uh, all the investors, except for Motorola, who didn't um, pay to play. Uh, that we were going to become a, a, a healthcare company in two years and exit in three. Luckily, we pulled it off. Um, and we got noticed. We were on CNN, Fox, uh, we did the Chilean miners. We sent someone down to the Chilean miners for uh, six weeks, and we had basically a billion people watching us help present data on the Chilean miners for six weeks, which um, you know, got us in front of Congress, uh, rep representing NASA for Congress, made us popular for a little while, but again, it's one of those value inflection points that really helped us be a brand without spending millions of dollars on advertising. And probably my most favourite activity was uh, competing with potential acquirers. So when we started beating Philips and beating GE, uh, we won their two hospitals that they had actually co-developed their product with, but we won the contract. And that helps their business development team justify internally why they need to buy us. Um, so you know, almost all due diligence goes out the window in value when they can simply say, well, we're losing to them, and they're small and we're big. So that was, that was very useful. Uh, exit strategy, uh, if, you're, if you're trying to get money off the top uh, 10 in uh, Sandhill Road, you've got to have a B. You've got to have 65% margin and show how you're going to get 85% market share. Um, then they ask who you are, and then they want to know about your product. So in that order, as a product guy, I normally started with who I was and what my product was until I befriended a few VCs and learned it's completely upside down. Um, that helped a lot. We learned retrospectively that the corporate development guys, so they're the guys that are writing the strategy of what they're going to buy in the next five years, um, They'd been watching us for between one and a half and two years. And some people say, uh, only people that have been watching you will buy you. I don't know if it's fully true. We had about 15 to 20 companies in our first round of um, down select, but we ended up being bought by somebody who'd been watching us. We'd been on their PowerPoints for two years, which was fun to become corporate development for our acquirer and then actually see their strategy and why they'd been looking for us. And it had nothing to do really with what we thought was making us valuable. Um, I've said partner or compete with acquirers. We had Motorola um, and 3M as investors and channel partners. Uh, we also had Under Armour as a partner. Uh, we found fairly quickly that our risk was time. We're burning cash. Their risk, they're a VP, say 55. Their job is to not screw up the billion dollar business that they're currently involved with, which means they're not going to go to market quickly. And so as a startup, that can just absolutely suck. Um, uh, the other rule we had was two startups never make money partnering together, which means you've, it's hard to choose who, actually who to partner with. Um, so Motorola was too slow for us. Um, Under Armour was using us to up their share price. Uh, we were on television helping get lots of TV ads, but they weren't interested in actually selling our product. 
Um, they just wanted to sell shirts and shoes. That's how they make billions of dollars. So understanding that, um, it's great for rounds. If you can say Under Armour's just signed, I can raise Series C really easily. But it doesn't actually lead to the revenue and your entire team can become focused on the famous partner as opposed to the partner that's going to make you cash. So I'd be very careful. I hear we've talked to Nike so often up in Auckland and usually it's like, well, I'm walking the other way because it's not going to make you money typically. Um, you have to be on the wave and that's what I think um, American VCs get that maybe we don't quite get here. There's discussions on the Gartner hype cycle, you know, there's pros and cons for it, but we, we stayed out of healthcare because we'd been asked to come in by potential customers, but it was disparate, it was hard to access, um, nobody really cared about it, and then Obamacare came in, and all of a sudden the entire country is focused on healthcare, and so um, that was, we predicted, luckily, correctly, in two years' time there's going to be a massive combination of wearables and healthcare. And because we did a pivot, usually that's something to be embarrassed about, um, we were the only company doing wearables and healthcare with a 10-year field experience because we'd been developing it for the military for 10 years. So we actually ended up having a really good story. Um, you have to design, define the entire process, but then be quite open to what you're not going to do. We were going to be acquired by a global organisation, so I was never going to spend money on a global sales force. So uh, understand what that acquirer is going to bring and then just don't spend money on it because you're not going to be adding to your value, just your, just your costs. And the line plan, I paid 30,000 US for the f accountant to write my first line plan um, until I learned how to do it. It makes the investors really happy when they see lots and lots of spreadsheets and as a picture guy I, I th find that hard. But when it came to the actual acquisition process, that was where I could show the rubber meeting the road, I could show who was going to buy, how they were buying, cost of acquisition. It made all the accounting and legal people really, really happy when they could see all these spreadsheets and then I could talk about them as the CEO. So um, that's something that I had to learn, but uh, turned out to be extremely valuable. Um, you're going to go to market, you better have enough cash, someone said that. Um, our American VCs were very, very good out of Silicon Valley of helping us strategize that. We set a price. Um, my job was to know the market, so I knew comparatives for the last five or ten years. So we started with that expectation, got laughed at a few times. We ended up getting close to it. Um, when you're going to choose a banker, uh, two things about bankers I learned, they better have a bigger list of potential acquirers than you have as the CEO. If, if not, choose somebody else that knows the market more than you. Um, the other one is, bankers have a pipeline and they have to keep that pipeline busy of deals, so there's a time when you need his attention to close your deal. You may have to grab him and say, stop doing business development, I need you for six weeks to close this off, because he's, he's working on the next one and the next one. Um, Due diligence, I've probably had five PAs and you could, they're completely correlated with due diligence with raising money. It just wears them out and they run away. So um, uh, raising money with VCs made us very good as a team, having our due diligence package ready, but um, having had that and my ADHD kicking in, uh, what we negotiated with JMP is we'll put one version on Dropbox and then when all the, all the questions come in from all these corporates, you will put them into, the, into their format. We will not do 10 different versions of due diligence. And so the bank who really, really helped with that with a um, junior person helping. There's just an absolutely massive amount of work there. Um, your accountant, your CTO, or your CFO, uh, they're going to get worn down um, doing this. Um, down select, I'd like to say we uh, looked at strategic fit, but we were just chasing the biggest return possible. And it simply came down to cash up front versus cash plus earn out. Um, we took the biggest number and then um, earned about half the unit. And uh, what did I say there? We'll forget that one. Last one. <laughs> um, here's where people like me want to be. And to get there, uh, the, the worst 18 months I've had in my life was the earn out. And the, 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 the cartoon that kept on coming up to me as I was driving through Colorado to head office was the the company used to be like this, you know, a happy little ele you know, elephant or animal in the safari and competing against all our competitors and tromping a few people up. We turned into a carcass and the vultures were the VPs and the new company that needed a piece of us to continue his career. And if he didn't take a bit of that responsibility under his, under his job, he would get a black mark against his job. So we were just ripped apart. So 
really the job post acquisition for me was to defend the team, keep them together for 18 months, make sure they were integrated into their different responsibilities so they were successful. They all now work for a $40 billion company, so they've got a job for life, so they're happy. Um, and make sure that ESOP and other payout terms have been looked after by them and look after the investors. They'd back me. My job was to get as much turnout as possible. Um, turns out a lot of customers like dealing with startups. They don't like dealing with big corporates. So that line plan and um, uh, pipeline for customers that we had as a small company, massively innovating, when it went to a three-year innovation cycle, a lot, of, a lot of our customers actually walked. So um, you know, it is what it is. But I have done that for a year and a half, and here I am. Now, my hari mai tenekoto katoa. For those of you I haven't met, I'm Ambassador Mark Gilbert, and I've been here in New Zealand for 22 months. Being a diplomat is my third career. Prior to this, I spent 29 years working for global investment banks, and I think that's why I have such a keen interest in what everyone is doing here today. When I arrived in New Zealand 22 months ago, I told my team that I wanted to make business a priority. As ambassador, other than the detailed work we have to do with the New Zealand government, I really get to set the agenda, and we've made business a very uh, significant part of that. One of the things that we have done at the embassy is that we have brought speakers to New Zealand that I believe have been very helpful. We've brought speakers from Microsoft and Oracle. Um, we brought Soraya Darabi from the New York Times. You may not know that name, but she's the one who took the New York Times from just just being a newspaper into the digital world. She came down here and she gave a number of talks and she met some of the young entrepreneurs. And after having those conversations, she said, you know what, I have somebody in New York that I would like for you to meet. Or I know somebody in Silicon Valley that you should be doing business with. It's building those relationships that um, gives us the opportunity at the embassy to make the business, the trade, the um, involvement of the U.S. in New Zealand such a, such a special thing. Um, and it is making those introductions and building those relationships. We have a, con um, uh, a group both in our consulate in Auckland and at the embassy in Wellington that is from our commerce department. They work with businesses, uh, businesses here in New Zealand who want to go into the U.S. and U.S. businesses who want to come to New Zealand. Uh, one of the things that I was very involved with was a conference we had in the United States uh, that President Obama started with uh, Commerce Secretary Pritzker called Select USA. So two years ago, I took a group of Kiwi companies to meet companies from 80 different countries over 2,500 people attending the conference, and every single company that went did a deal. Because not only did they get a chance to meet people from other countries, we had each of our 50 states represented, and they were looking to offer uh, incentives to come open a manufacturing in their particular state, or, or to open a sales office. And that's what our team does. They do it from as little as teaching you how to open a bank account in the US, to acquiring visas for your employees, but to the point of being able to make introductions to people that can help you with your business. The other thing as ambassador that has been a great thing for me is that I have convening power. Different than I worked when I worked at investment banks, because I did everything from venture to M&A to LBOs to IPOs, did the, the whole gamut. And personally, I've invested in a number of startups all the way through to investing in Broadway musicals. And I've loved every single one that I've invested in. Well, most of the ones that I've, that I've invested in. But we have the ability to bring people together. So just two weeks ago, we brought a group of people together, some from the New Zealand government, like NZTE and Callahan Innovation, with fund managers, with people from universities, uh, with startups, to talk about what's happening here in New Zealand. And the reason that's important is a lot of these people don't talk to each other. It's not that they don't like each other, it's just that they don't have the occasion to all get together and and sit around a table. So it's something that we are able to do. Uh, we're very proud that we get to do it, but then we also get to offer our assistance where we can add some expertise. Uh, last year, 
uh, at this conference when we had Pitch on the Peak. There were 15 companies that made presentations. Because of my background, there were two that I said, you know what, these companies should be doing business in the US. We talked after the conference, we set up appointments, they came into the embassy, and now both of them are doing business in the US. One had already started the exploration, we helped them get across the line, and the other one we made the introductions to them uh, with companies that we thought made a lot of sense. Now, different than my prior job, I'm not here trying to do deals. But what I can do is I can make introductions. And by getting to travel around the country and getting to meet people, you never know when you're going to meet somebody else who might be a right match. And I'd like to tell you a quick story. A gentleman got onto my calendar. I'm not even sure how he got onto the calendar, but my team knew that it was in an industry that I really liked. It was an environmental friendly company. Uh, we'll just leave it at that. And he comes in for a meeting and he starts to tell me about what he's doing. And he's based in California. And I said, you know, I hate to interrupt you, but there's a company in Florida who's doing the exact same thing. And I've been talking about this company for five years, how I think this is going to be the next big breakthrough, do you know anything about them? He says, I do. He said, I own them. So he goes and talks to me about why he's here in New Zealand, because the company that he's working on now needed a certain kind of technology that was only available here in New Zealand. And he goes through and he runs through this and I think, you know, this guy really has a great idea. Now, a lot of times, as you know, if people have had prior exits, that can tell you a little bit about how good they are at managing business. So this gentleman had two prior exits. His first company he sold to General Electric. His second com company he sold to United Technologies, two of the world's largest companies. I knew that this company that he's working on is going to be a home run. And because of a meeting that I had six months earlier with an investor here in New Zealand who has an interest in this kind of field, um, I was able to put the two of them together. Because it was, it was unique, the uh, gentleman who I met from the States was looking for tens of millions of dollars of investment, uh, and this gentleman was able to do it. So being here as the ambassador, you know, some people say I'm the United States investment banker to New Zealand. So I get the opportunity to meet a lot of people, get to come to conferences like this, uh, make relationships, and hopefully put a lot of people to, you know, together. So anyways, thank you for having me, and I'll turn it back over. Thanks.